Hey everybody, it's TJ with A Good Day of Roll Die. Uh, the second part of Star Trek Alliance just came out today. It's March 1st, 2023. So at least here in the U.S. it came out. If you're somewhere else, uh, your, mi your miles may vary. Um, I haven't gotten it in person yet, but the cards all uh, appeared on Utopia today. And I thought uh, I wanted to go through the set list, kind of get my thoughts on how these fit cards fit into Alliance and how it fit into uh, the greater attack wing meta, as it were. And since they're mostly Klingon cards, I uh, definitely have a lot of interest in that and excitement for myself to start adding these into my fleet. So I have the Utopia page pulled up here, and I have the Utopia set viewer for Alliance Part 2. And I'm just going to run down the list here. So we have ships, elite talents, weapons, tech, and crew in that order. And uh, they go by point value. So, so we'll go right down that list here. So we, we start off with our, our, our uh, generic ships. Uh, and uh, one thing to note here, kind of interesting, this is not one of the playable ships. This is one of the AI ships here, the Gem Hadar Battle Cruiser. But uh, it's actually been recosted. So the ge previous generic Gem Hadar was 29 points. Now it's just 27. So kind of interesting there. Uh, and I believe this is the second recosting. So, um, first ship that's been recosted twice, uh, when a fair number of, of ships haven't been recosted at, at all yet, so. Uh, then we have the Vorcha, and we have the Cavort here. Um, really nothing much uh, different than, than their appearances in the 2017 core set. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that we maybe, I was hoping that we maybe get another crew slot on the Vorcha. Uh, because it's you know kind of a larger ship, and we, we've seen some more recent ships come up, and it's had a, a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of upgrade slots, um, especially like the, the new Prometheus. I think has five slots as a generic, but um, it's really maybe more for my own uh, own personal benefit to have that extra crew slot on a on a board ship. Uh, I do think it's interesting. The two chosen ships for Alliance here are very, very similar. Um, I believe their maneuver dials are almost the same. I think the Vorcha has a has a green maneuver on the, on the two banks, but um, you know, they have the same number of slots here: one tech, one weapon, one crew. Um, the only real difference is the Cavort is uh, a little bit less powerful on the attack. And I think it's interesting if you compare that to what we get in the Alliance pack for Federation, where the Akira and the Excelsior are a little bit more distinguished. The Excelsior, uh, it's not as powerful, it's not as maneuverable, but it has, an, has a tech slot, and uh, has that 180 degree firing arc on the front end, versus the Akira, which is a little more of your attack ship. It's more maneuverable, it's got more power, uh, but it's, you know, it doesn't have that tech slot, it's, it's all about weaponry. So, you know, there were two different kind of play styles you, you could do there uh, very easily just by picking what, what ship you want to start with. Uh, whereas Alliance, you know, um, where's the incentive to choose a Cavort over a Vorcha? I'm not sure what, it, what, what the incentive is there necessarily. Um, and, and as we'll see as we go through some of these cards here, the incentive comes into what cards you can actually play on either of those ships. and. Um, you know, it's an interesting approach. I think there's, uh, there's maybe some downsides to that as well. And then we have your uh, generic uh, Galar class starship there. Okay. So, going down into our elite talents, we have uh, coordinated assault. This is actually a fed talent. So the, there are a couple new fed cards in here to expand upon what you could get in the first part of Alliance. Uh, so we have a five-point elite talent. It's got a range of one uh, coordinated assault. And it's a unique talent. Uh, after attacking or defending, target a friendly ship within range and spend a battle station and evade or a scan token from beside the ship and place a copy of that token beside the target ship. I, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, there is no lack of token acquiring ability for Federation ships. Uh, there's a lot of synergy you can build in between ships. And, um, you know, I, I can see having uh, having just made an attack and maybe you didn't need that battle station token. 
um, or I think for a scan especially, you know, you can you could uh, put a scan token on one ship, attack, and then pass it on to the next ship, make another attack, and you're, you're continually de depriving your opponent of defense dice. So definitely, definitely very interesting uh, ability here, um, especially if you're going to run a, a small little squad of ships in, in close uh, close formation. Then we have evasive maneuvers. This is our first Klingon talent, um, and this one establishes kind of two of the themes, two of the three themes that I see in this uh, in this pack. Uh, so number one is it's uh, it's got the cavort symbol here, so it's limited to the cavort class, uh, and as we're going to see, there are quite a number of feder uh, not federation Klingon cards in this uh, pack that are limited to a specific class or two. Um, this is evasive maneuvers. It's four points, uh, and its ability is when the ship spends an evade token, you place one time token on this card, and you can place one evade token beside the ship. Uh, the second theme I see in this pack is parallels to Part One Alliance, where you have certain Federation cards are mimicked in the Klingon cards. So in the Part One Alliance, we have Battle Hardened which uh, that allowed you to, after you spent the battle station token, to do another battle station token. In a very similar manner to evasive maneuvers here. Um, I think this is, evasive maneuvers is the weaker of those two cards. Um, it's much more versatile to have a battle station token. And I feel like evade tokens are, you know, uh, of, of all the things you can choose on an action bar for a cohort, ev evade tokens are probably going to be on the, you know, the, the less likely end of things. Um, I feel like if you're building around getting evade tokens, you're already kind of defeating yourself a little bit. Um, so I think, I think it's interesting. Um, in, in the Alliance environment, I think it's probably more useful. Uh, in Attack Wing, I wish it was maybe a little bit cheaper. Uh, as it is, I think it's kind of pricey uh, for, for what it does and for the limited use of it on cohorts. Uh, then we have Reckless Assault, four points. Um, it's one per ship. Uh, also range 1, uh, when attacking with the ship's primary weapon, if you are within the target's primary firing arc, you can roll plus 1 attack deck. Uh, prob probably overpriced again, uh, but I really like this. I think it's very thematic for Klingons um, to just go straight at their opponent. Um, I think it would be interesting to put this with uh, um, Korok. Uh, Korok, uh, his bird of prey and, and Korok, uh, they both have abilities that also trigger at when attacking at range 1. So it'd be kind of fun to put it all on there and just kind of play with it. But uh, again, um, I definitely think I, I, I could see myself using this in Alliance just to have fun with it and, and to, you know, be a, that reckless attacking <laughs> Klingon player. Um, in a one-on-one -on -one environment, again, it might be kind of fun, but um, I, still, I still feel it's maybe, again, a, a bit overpriced if you wanted to do a, a, a you know, put it into match play. Uh, Battle Plan, another Federation talent, a unique one, range 1 again. Uh, when attacking, if the target is within range of both this ship and at least one other friendly ship, you can add one Battle Station result to the ship's attack roll. Um, I, I like that. Again, if you're running a small squad of ships, if you're doing a, a uh, Saber Swarm, maybe, um, you know, getting the Battle Station, I mean, pretty much you're probably converting that to a hit. So you're essentially getting that extra hit out of it at close range. Um, that's, that's that's pretty nice. Um, I think the price is right there. So um, I, I could see using this in, in the right fleet um, to, you know, to to play against my opponent. You know, it's like a, a Saber Swarm, I think, would be a fun place to put this in. Uh, we have Strafing Room. I've got a another class limited elite talent three points uh, this is now cavorts and the burrell the bird of praise strafing run so during the execute maneuver step if your ship's base or maneuver template overlapped an opposing ship roll one attack die on a hit or a crit result the opposing ship suffers one damage uh, again i think very on point for klingons uh, it sounds like a very fun card uh, i could see myself Putting this on like a low skill captain, I think uh, as a claim. Where is that guy here? Where is my? Here we go. I think this is it. 
that claim two points, two skill, elite talent slot, a cheap clearing captain, put Clang on a generic Burrell with a striking run and just uh, intentionally ram, ram into your opponent <laughs> to, to potentially cause some damage or, or do a bunch of uh, comebouts and stuff and cross over your opponent's path before they have a chance to move. I, I can see having fun with that. You know, that, that's a lot of 18. You know, like an 18 point ship, like a number number four ship in a, in a, a fleet, just to just to kind of harass your opponent would be kind of fun. So for that reason, I I, I like that talent. Um, and I, I can see putting that into alliance as well, um, and just running rough shot over over some dominion ships. I, I, I like that. This ship again, kind of uh, this excuse me, this card introduces kind of the third theme I see out of this pack, and that is. Um, abilities that are based upon uh, chance, at least, at least in part. So there are a number of cards in this pack that uh, require you to roll an attack die to determine whether or not the ability pops off, and um, Strafing One is, is an example of that. Uh, then we have Fight with Honor. This is a Klingon only talent, Klingon captain only. Uh, three points. Uh, when attacking the ship with an equal or higher captain skill number than the ship, convert a battle station to a crit. Um, I, again, I really like this this card as well. Uh, I think it kind of incentivizes low skill captain builds, whereas in the last two years, three years, it's been high skill Dahar Master fleets that are, are pretty predominant for Klingons. Uh, and here's a here's an option to kind of turn that on its head, give you some conversion, some pretty good conversion, uh, battle station to a crit um, when you, when you're attacking someone of a higher skill level. I think this would be really interesting to put on. Uh, Baytor from the IKS Terrell prize pack because she allows other captains within range of her to use her elite talent like it's their own. And there's some questions in the language there as to whether it can be used multiple times. Um, and I, I put in a question with the Fremont group to see what they think on that. But um, if it can be used multiple times, uh, that could be interesting for a Burrell swarm uh, with uh, low skill captains. So. Yeah, I like this one. I think there are two copies of this uh, card in the Alliance pack, so it's kind of nice to share the wealth there as well. Uh, then we have uh, two, I think two more new talents. Yeah, two more. Uh, a little bit cheaper ones. Eye for an eye. Again, Klingon only captain. Two points. Uh, when you're defending, you have a deal damage step. If this ship suffers a face-up damage card, and the attacking ship is in your primary firing arc, you can discard this card to deal the attacking ship one face-up damage card, even if it has active shields. Uh, I think that's cool. Uh, for two points, uh, you're going to, as with a Klingon ships, you're going to be receiving face-up damage cards at some point, uh, more than more than likely. Um, so to, to give that a little bit back to your opponent is uh, is pretty fun. And you can combine this with uh, reinforced bulkheads from the 2017 core pack. Uh, so, let me start this set here. So, reinforced bulkheads. Now, uh, when you're defending and you receive a face of damage card, you can turn it face down unless it's a warp core breach. So, you could get that face of damage card, discard eye for an eye to give a face of damage card to your opponent, and then you just turn that card face down and uh, not, having, uh, not, not being affected by it. So, I think that could be a potentially interesting combo there. Alright, yeah, where are we? Uh, and finally we have Glory to the Empire. Two points, uh, not unique. When attacking or defending, you discard this card to reroll all your dice. And I think again there are two copies of this in the Alliance pack. Um, I like that. It's either a, a free target lock essentially, um, or I mean, especially for defending, there aren't a lot of cards that allow you to reroll your defense dice like you can your attack dice. And if the Klingons attempt you, really, you really want to do that. So I'm um, looking two points uh, for that as well. Uh, then we get into our weapons. So forward battery. Uh, this is the first time now we see this is restricted to Vorcha and Megavar class ships. Five points. So for five points, it better be pretty good um, for a weapon here. Uh, so forward battery is when defending. Declare target step. If the attacking ship is in your primary firing arc. Roll one attack die on a hit or a crit result. Deal one damage to the attacking ship before it attacks. And um, 
I mean, it's interesting that it might be one of the few, if maybe the only weapon I can think of that really is more of a defensive measure. So it, it kind of, uh, you know, is, it maybe uh, disincentivizes your opponent from attacking you. But again, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a roll attack die, it's a random chance kind of thing as to whether it'll work. Um, I just think for five points it's just too much. Um, you know, in an environment where you have two-point Federation torpedoes and you can uh, put a Thaleron thal thal weapon underneath uh, triphasic emitters for two points, um, to have a five-point weapon that sometimes does damage, uh, one, one point of damage just doesn't seem like a lot to me. Um, I, I, maybe an alliance, it's, it maybe has an advantage. I haven't seen the campaigns. Maybe there's a, a, a place within those missions where it makes sense, but uh, right now uh, it doesn't seem like it would be worthwhile to me. And then we get photon torpedoes. The, uh, I, I've been much anticipating a new photon torpedoes for Klingons, especially with the really great Federation torpedoes we've seen. So here we have uh, three point torpedoes. Okay, so the Federation ones are two. Uh, the attack value of this weapon is the primary weapon value of the ship plus one, so that's good. Um, attack is pretty standard torpedo. You spend the target lock, disable the card to target the ship, um, and then you can convert one blank into a crit. So you, you pretty much guarantee a crit result, which is nice. But um, I mean, this is, to me, this is a little disappointing, especially again when, when you look at. Federation torpedoes, where you can convert all your blanks into pretty much guaranteed hits. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of a lot of ways you can easily pull a target lock and do a battle station on the same turn to guarantee those hits. Um, and, and I mean, I think I would like this a lot more if it was two points, right? Because I mean, you could cross faction fed torpedoes for the same amount, and you're probably going to end up doing more damage. Um, so this is kind of disappointing uh, to. To have uh, just to see how this card, you know, uh, is is formatted here. Two points would be a lot better. I'd be a lot happier with it. Three points, yeah. Um, I would probably just use five torpedoes. Uh, disruptor overcharge. So four to only three points. Range one to two. You want to attack them with the ship's primary weapon? You can roll an attack die. If you roll at least, uh, during the roll of attack dice step, excuse me, while you're rolling all of your attack dice, if you roll at least one critical result, you can add one hit to the total. So again, here's another parallel with what we saw with the Feb cards. Uh, they have overcharged phasers, which adds plus one attack uh, with your primary weapon at range one to two. Here we have, if you roll at least one critical hit result with your primary weapon at that range, you can add one. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm okay with that. You know, hey, going back to fight with honor, right? We can convert that critical hit to guarantee a crit, and then, you know, we can guarantee that disruptor overcharge. So um, I can see some comboing going on here. Um, I don't mind that for three points. It's, again, it's pretty much the equivalent to overcharge phasers, so I would put those kind of on the same level here. Converging fire I really like. Um, two points, uh, so it's really cheap. It's limited to Vorcha and Megvar class again. But during the combat phase, other friendly ships can treat your target lock as if it was their own, which I think is really cool. Um, and especially when you combine it with, I'm going to skip ahead for a second, but you have this tech uh, card targeting array that essentially gives you two target locks for four points. Um, so when you perform a target lock action, you can take two target locks at the same time, and then your other friendly ships can use either of those target locks. Um, so I can see this being, you know, doing a generic Vulture as kind of a support ship with those two target locks. Other ships in your fleet can then use them. Um, I'm thinking, you know, combine this with a couple of Federation ships with fed torpedoes on them. Uh, you know, that could be an interesting combination, an interesting mixed fleet there. So I like this for two points. I think it's, I think it's really awesome. Uh, final weapon is Torpedo Fuselade. Uh, everyone, I think, who's been in the game for a while knows this one. Uh, I think it would be, it's going to be really nice in uh, an alliance because your uh, Dominion AI ships often run in formation. So, you know, you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to be able to, to, to tag a couple ships at a time with this weapon. And then outside of 
uh, Alliance and Attack Wing, obviously through a few is, is a really, if you can set it up, it can be a really devastating card. Uh, I think it's really the only native Klingon multi-attack weapon in the game too. So yeah, it's pretty solid. Um, I have no problems with that showing up here. I get into tech. Enhanced thrusters. Uh, Cavort and Burrell only. Five points. Uh, during the execute maneuver step, and this ship performs a bank maneuver of a speed 203. We can treat that maneuver as a red maneuver to rotate the ship 180 degrees. So essentially you're getting some more flexibility on your come about maneuvers. I really like that concept. Um, I think we've seen that extra maneuverability in fleets is really useful. Um, with the arrival of Raman and Torkin device, uh, Raman and Torkin device has been running roughshod on uh, a lot of our, our tournament fleets in the Fremont group. Uh, but it's five points. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot to to ask, and it's limited to two classes of ship. Um, I, this has to be cheaper to really make it useful. I mean, again, cross faction for five points. You can put a Raman and Culkin device on any Klingon ship, and there's a ton, ton of maneuverability built into one of those with those sensor echoes. Um, so to, to choose this over something like that has to be you know, a lot more enticing. And uh, if this was a three, for sure. Uh, if it's a four, okay. If it's a five, um, you know, maybe in alliance, uh, there, there's some value there, but probably not in the tech one. Uh, we talked about targeting array. I like that one a lot. I think that the price is right. Uh, then we have a reactor event. So four points. Uh, range one during the combat phase. If there is an opposing ship within range, you may spend one aux token from beside the ship to roll an attack die. So again, we're rolling a, an attack die for the effect. On a hit or a crit, you can discard one shield token from the opposing ship. So it's not just one damage, it has to have, to have shields, uh, but it doesn't have to be active shields. So that could be useful. You could discard a token from the side of cloak ship and, and maybe force them out of, uh, you know, might, might prevent them from cloaking in, in future rounds. And you're getting rid of a, a ox token, which is kind of nice. Um, you know, it's limited to range one, um, and you have to make sure that the targeted ship has shields. But it, it's, it's a really effective way to get rid of, a, get rid of an ox token. Um, cross factionally, you could put this on, say, a Federation ship with the Ships of the Line Cisco crew card, um, and you know, maybe put it on a, on a Prometheus class or, or something like that where Cisco is re enabling a secondary weapon. Every turn, he generates an AUX token, you use a reactive event to maybe purge that token and do some potentially extra damage to your opponent. Might be, might be interesting, especially since it's range one, you could put it on Prometheus with multi vector attack mode. Um, so there, there's something there. I, I think it would be interesting to play with that, and I, I would definitely consider you know, maybe trying to build around that. Secondary Cloaking Coil. Three points as an action. You can discard the card to repair one shield token. If you have a cloak action on the ship's action bar, you may uh, do a cloaking action as a free action. I mean, I think we've all been in the situation, if we've run cloak ships before, that we get caught off guard, we lose the cloak, we then get attacked and lose our shields, and then we're stuck without the cloak for the, the remainder of that ship's very short life at that point. Um, so there, are, there is a, there's a place for this kind of action that would be really useful to have that. Um, I just think it's kind of limited, even at three points. Um, as we're seeing here, the Klingons have gotten some uh, pretty interesting, uh, nice new tech, and um, you know I think most cleaning ships only have one tech slot, so I, I just don't see this as a, as a as a prime use of that that space at this point. But um, it's an interesting idea. Uh, we have another Fed card here, extend shields. So for three points at range one. If you have one or more active shields, you can place three time tokens on this card and an ox token beside this ship. You target a friendly ship within range, you repair one of those uh, that friendly ship's shield tokens. That's pretty useful. Uh, Federation has no shortage of, <laughs> of shielded ships. Um, you know, and, and to be able to repair that would be nice. I don't know if be, I don't think there's really a, a lot of ways to um, speed up this process. 
and removal of time tokens quicker, but uh, you know it's it's not too bad. Uh, I, I think I, I can see a place for that in a, in a federation fleet. Moving back to Klingons, we have passive sensors. Two points. Um, at the end phase, if you do not attack this round, you can place a scan token on this card for a max of one at a time. And then as a free action, you can place a scan token from this card beside the ship. Actually, I do like this one. It's, it's cheap. It, uh, you know, it allows Klingons to use an action that they normally don't have access to. Um, you know, to, to gain that token, you can't attack that round, but you know, the first round, that's probably going to be true, so you're going to have this token by the second round at least. And, um, and then you can you can deploy it when when you need to as a free action. So um, I like that. It's cheap. It, uh, it gives you some flexibility. But I can see that uh, you know, there's a place for that uh, that card, especially if maybe you you have like a clean out support ship that you know where they can make use of that scan. Um, uh, I, I, I'm thinking like if you can find a way to put passive sensors and detection grid together on a clean out ship, that would be uh, that would be interesting. But um, yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I like that. Uh, now here's kind of the, the money card here. Reinforced hull. Uh, two points. It's limited to ships with hull four or greater, but it's not limited to just clean out ships. It could be any, any ship with a hull four or, four or greater. And you get plus two to the ship's hull value. Um, right here, this is going to be... Um, I, I don't think it's, it's a hot take to say this is going to become a very common tech card. That you see on Klingon ships in, in both Alliance as well as in uh, a match play and an attack line, and even outside of Klingon ships, uh, Fed ships, Dominion, whatever, uh, Romulans, um, you know, anyone who's cloaked you know, would really like some extra hull for sure. Um, anyone who, you know, like the Federation, where they have so many shield enhancing cards where they can easily max out their shields with a rear of three, uh, well, now you can add some hull value as well. And, make it even tankier. So this is going to be a, you know, a, a big, big card to come out of this pack, I think, you know, just because it's so cheap and it is really valuable. Um, I can understand why they did the 4 plus hole. I mean, you would love to have this on the Burrell, but then you have you would end up having a Burrell, a generic Burrell, for example, having the same stat line as a, as a Cavort, and, and it would be 5 points cheaper, and that's probably probably breaking the game a little bit, so I can understand the restriction, and I think it does great for what it is, so um, that's a great card. Uh, last tech we have is secondary relays, so when the ship would disable a secondary weapon upgrade, if you don't have any aux tokens beside the ship, you can place an aux token beside the ship instead of doing the disable. Um, I, I, I have no problem with that, again, it's really cheap, um, it's a great way to keep a, a weapon going. Um, you know, it's only going to work on weapons that have a disable, but full-time torpedoes would be a common one, whether you're using the new Klingon one or even the older fed full-time uh, tor torpedo that disables. Um, any ox, ox token is not a thing that you really have to worry about. Um, if you combine this with Chitarg from the Blood Oath pack, that would be a nice mix-up here. Where's Chitarg? Right here. So put Chitarg as your crew, you're generating an ox token when you're attacking, it also is going to cause your cloak to flip to red, and at the end of the phase, you just take away that ox token and you retain your cloak. So you get basically a perma cloak uh, with by for you know, and you're losing your ox token. So um, yeah, I, I definitely see some value there for two points. Secondary relays is pretty solid. Getting into our crew, we have first officer. Um, this is kind of your commander equivalent from Alliance. Uh, part one. Four points. When attacking or defending, place a time token on this card. Convert one battle station into one hit or one of eight. Um, that's not, it's not bad. Uh, my first thought is you're going to combine this with Ezri. So you, you don't take time tokens, and since this, this is not an optional ability, you can use it as many times as you need to during the turn. So you can do multiple conversions on attack and defense. Um, and that, that would be a really useful way to, to play with this card. Um, I do think Commander, the Federation version, is a little bit nicer since if that is an action that you end up getting an uh, evade in a, in a battle station token. Um, uh, but, but then you're not getting a, uh, you don't have to spend an action here. So I think there's, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, trade-off. 
yeah, I think there's a there's an interesting place for this card um, if you can find a way to eliminate those time tokens. Uh, and Ezri would be the really the only way I can think of right now. But so uh, yeah, I, I, I can see that being used in some uh, settings. Then we have weapons officer. Uh, this would be equivalent to tactical officer from the part one pack. Uh, although oddly enough, there's also a, a tactical officer in this game. Uh, so when attacking, you disable this card to convert one of your battle station results into a crit result, and all of other your all of your other battle station results into hit results. So effectively, it's a Engaren or Drex. Uh, Clone, not even clone, because it's not the same ability. It's very similar. Now, their ability is an action. It affects every attack you do in that round, which can be really useful. This is not an action, so you don't have to spend the action to, to get this ability. You do have to disable the card, which means you have to find a way to re-enable it later. Um, so there's some trade-offs. Uh, uh, weapons officer is going to be a lot easier to find right now. Uh, Drex and Gear aren't, aren't exactly easy to find packs anymore. I'm not even sure what, what packs they're in, but uh, I, I know they're, they're out of print for sure. Um, and, you know, you could use Bashir to re-enable it every turn. Um, and, you know, this isn't going to be affected by Talshiar, Scout, or Vorik, or, or some of those other cards that will steal your, your, your tokens away from you during the combat phase. So, um, yeah, I, I will admit I was really down on this card when it was first previewed a couple weeks ago, and I thought this was absolute garbage. Um, I changed my mind on that. It's actually a pretty decent card for what it is. Um, and it's just, you know, you have to decide whether you want to use the action with Drex uh, or Engaren or whether you want to use this as a, you know, attacking ability um, and what kind of flexibility you want in, in, a, in a build. So, Operations Officer, uh, four points. Um, so if it's equipped to a Cavort class, it adds plus one to the ship's agility value. Uh, and then for every any ship, when it's defending, you can convert a battle station result into an ability. Um, I really wish this wasn't restricted to cavorts. Um, I think I understand why they did that. I'll get to that in a minute. But um, I mean, without this ability, this is just Toral that costs twice as much. Right? So. We have Terrell from the 2017 starter set, and I really like him. He's really good. Um, because he's only two points, and he does a easy conversion on, on defending, and you know with Klingons, but you know, you're rolling five defense dice, you're probably going to get at least one battle station convert. That's very nice. Um, so if you, you're paying twice as much for it, uh, and you know, this is kind of like the a Klingon version of Hood Riker, right? So the USS Hood Riker, it's three points, he adds plus one agility, plus he does a conversion. Um, but this is just a less useful, more expensive version of that. Um, and you know, outside of Alliance, you don't see a lot of cohorts getting used, outside maybe from the Vorn. And uh, you know, there's, there's better things to put on the Vorn to fill up those crew slots than, than this. So you know, a Vorn is not a defense, is not a defense first ship. Um, and this is just not a very good uh, defense card, unfortunately. Um, I, I see it. I, I can see using this in alliance for sure uh, on a, on a cohort class, but not outside the alliance, unfortunately. Uh, we have science officer. Then we have a science officer in part one, um, and that was uh, that side, the fed science officer would be two scan tokens for an action. Here we get one scan token, which is nice because Klingons again don't usually have access to those. Plus, you can remove a target lock token from beside your ship, and I think that's really interesting. I think it's a really nice ability. Definitely going to work really well in Alliance because uh, your Galar class ships um, are the only way they can really uh, affect the quality of their attack rolls is by target locking you. So, if you take that away from them, uh, that's going to be really nice to, to see here. I, I can see putting this on like a high skill captain in attack wing. Um, so, you know, your opponent target locks you, then you move after them, activate later, you remove that target lock, and you really can, you know, can't get, you're not going to end up getting shot with torpedoes, for example. Um, I can see putting this, potentially, it's going to be kind of costly, it's going to be nine points, 
but three points for science officer and six points for Spock uh, on a uh, you know on a Klingon ship or vice versa four points for science officer five for Spock on a Fed ship something like that uh, but you know, you're going to get that scan token to convert to battle stations with Spock plus you kind of you know uh, are going to be frustrating your opponent by taking away some of their quality so I, I again I, I like this card for three points I think it's interesting um, it's that ability is, is somewhat unique um, for a crew um, I, I would like to see that I, I want to see some, some combos with that then we have a final federation card engineering officer so it's a perform action step you disable this card uh, and it should perform an action one action while having any aux token beside it so it's it's kind of like the ability on the uh, original USS Enterprise from Wave Zero. I'll go way down here. There it is. Right? Where it can perform any action from its action bar while it has an auxiliary power token. Uh, this one allows you to do any action, which is really nice. It doesn't have to be limited to your action bar. But it's only one action, so you can't take you know multiple free actions and things like that. But I think there's a place for that. Uh, Alliance, especially if you're running an Excelsior class, uh, or if you've upgraded and you're running a, a Galaxy class as a as a more skilled captain, uh, and you, you know, really need to make make a hard turn, but you can't bear to lose your action. There, he's there for that. And I think there's probably some some combos to be found out there in, on the tackling side of things where this would be an advantage as well. So. Yeah, I, I like that for three points. I think that's a, a, a solid crew card. Uh, tactical officer, I think, might be uh, one of the best crew cards, and, and it's kind of right up there with the reinforced hole. I think in terms of its, it's potential usefulness uh, in attacking because it's it's just two points. It's, it's a cheap crew card, but when you're attacking, if you have a target lock on a ship, you can choose to spend it as a battle station. This is, I think this is the cheapest way that our Klingons can make use of battle station or battle station like action. Um, and uh, it gives you flexibility. You know, if you have a target lock, you, you roll, you attack. If you get a lot of blanks, well, you can, you can just re roll those. Now, if you get a lot of battle stations, you can convert those instead. I, I love that flexibility there uh, for a single target lock to be used in, in two different ways. So I, I mean I can see this being used uh, in in you know tackling builds uh, to give your Klingons a cheap way to access battle stations. And then finally we have helmsman uh, and, and I like this uh, I like this one too. Um, you know the Fed helmsman gave you the ability to increase or decrease your movement by one uh, for whatever move uh, maneuver you chose. This one. Uh, basically gives you an extra maneuver, an extra one maneuver, a bank or a straight, um, as long as you, as long as that maneuver, uh, the initial maneuver you made was a, a non-red maneuver and you didn't overlap any ships or obstacles. So you can't bump anything uh, and you can't perform a red maneuver here, but if you meet those two qualifications, you can disable this card and do an additional maneuver. And I think that's really nice. Uh, again, I think that meets the, the flavor of the Klingons, where again, they're, uh, you know, they have the more, more uh, fast attacking maneuverable ships and things like that. Um, and the, the extra bit of movement, movement can be really, really important, um, you know, especially in the, I think the current game environment for attack room, to be able to move around more so than just that, that one maneuver you, you would normally get. Uh, so, um, what's the overall impression here? Um, uh, number one good things, I. I think the tech overall is pretty good. I really like the fact that we got a lot of Klingon tech, and a lot of it is pretty useful, right? Um, reinforced hull, I think you're going to see that a lot. Secondary relays can be really useful with torpedoes. Um, passive sensors, I think, has a place. Um, reactor vent and, and targeting array. Targeting array, I think, is going to be a fantastic card as well. So we have some really good tech, uh, and, and Klingons could use some tech. Um, I, I like Tactical Officer, I like Helmsman, um, Science Officer is interesting. Um, really the only kind of dud here might be Operations Officer. It's just a little too restrictive and too, too pricey. So crew and tech are good. Uh, weapons, 
kind of a uh, convergent fire. I really like that for the cost. Um, Disruptor overcharge is okay. A uh, fuller battery is just too expensive. Um, cold temper POs, again, I feel it's a little too expensive for what it is, especially given some of the other quality torpedoes you can get for three points on a Klingon ship. So, uh, and then the, the Elite's talents are actually nice. Uh, Klingons can do for some, some cheaper Elite talents. Um, and uh, I, think, I think we get some of those here. Um, I think both two-point and three-point talents have, have a place, a potential place in the game. So uh, where, does, where does this kind of fall short? Um, again, I feel there are some cards that are just a little too pricey for what they are. Like enhanced thrusters, um, forward battery, Evasive maneuvers and maybe reckless assault, and, and then the operations officer is just way too expensive considering the limitations. Uh, and that's the other thing too is that a lot of these cards have have a lot of limitations as to where you can place them, uh, and we didn't see that in part one of Alliance, um, but we see it a lot here. So you know you're going to have to choose whether you're going to put this on a Borcha or a, a Kavort or what have you. And that's it. Um, so they have really limited viability outside of the Klingon faction type, as opposed to, you know, most of the um, Part One Alliance cards. You can cross faction them pretty, pretty much at, at your whim. And um, I, I think the reason for that limited ability is because if you go back to the Cavort and the Vorchas, because they're so indistinguishable from one another, aside from the the attack value difference. I feel like the designers uh, of, uh, of the game here felt like they needed to restrict the use of some of these cards to uh, give players more of a, a feeling of choice as to, well, if I, if I want to play the game this way, if I want to have a more maneuverable ship that's more defensive, I'm going to have to pick a cavort because, you know, I, I can't put evasive maneuvers on the board ship. I can't put strafing them on the board ship, right? Uh, but if I want a more uh, attack first, attack forward ship, well, you know, then I'm gonna have to pick the Vorcha if I want to use forward battery or disruptor overcharge or um, uh, which other one I'm thinking of here, convergent fire. I think is the other one. Yeah. So um, you can tell the the Vorcha is being set up to be the more attack heavy ship. The Cavort is set up to be the more uh, evasive, movable ship, because that's where you get the plus one agility from the operations officer. That's where you can use enhanced thrusters. Um, that's where you, you're using strafing run and, and evasive maneuvers. And, I mean, for the game itself, I get it. These cards are balanced for Alliance, and it makes sense then for Alliance to try to distinguish the two uh, when the ships themselves aren't terribly different. But it uh, definitely has an, a, a cooling effect on what these cards can do for a tackling as a whole. Uh, because the fact is, uh, I, I don't see a lot of these restricted cards being super useful um, outside of maybe, again, Convergent Fire if you want to do like a, a Vorcha or a support ship or something like that. Um, and again, I think some of these cards may be a little bit overpriced, um, and I only wonder if that would do the fact that um, uh, with the part two of Alliance when you're starting with Klingons, you get ten experience points rather than just six like you started with part one. So that's a fair amount of uh, points to, to divvy out and you only have three slots in which to assign those plus your elite talent. Um, so I wonder if they, maybe some of these, these cards are a little bit overpriced because it again gives you this, for players a sense of more choice like well I, I can't um, I can't choose all the cards I want because they're too expensive versus you know, having a bunch of cheap cards and then not uh, just filling up all these uh, these upgrade slots without maxing out your, your points, uh, which would you know, also be frustrating. So um, overall, I really like, like these cards. Um, I just don't feel like they have, uh, aside from maybe a couple like Reinforced Hull, uh, is, is the real standout here. I don't think they're going to have a huge impact on how Klingon players play with tackling. Um, but I think it will be a lot of fun to use them in Alliance, and I'm looking forward to getting my hands on the actual uh, product here in the near future and actually getting a chance to, to play a game with it. So, um, yeah, so let me know what you think, uh, and uh, let me know, uh, you know how Alliance is working for you here. 
uh, and I appreciate your, your listening to me ramble here for the last 30 minutes or so, and uh, kapla, have a good night.